when Madison published Federalist 10, he did not actually believe what he was writing, hmm. which is an interesting sort of thing to appreciate about the Federalist Papers, is that some of them were not entirely honest. So, Jay, thanks so much for joining me to do this. Thanks, Jonah. I'm really pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. You've been my colleague at AEI for a while, but I never see you because you're a non-resident fellow. I'm, not, I'm a non-resident fellow, Ooh, yes. Which is sort of academic jargon for serial killer, but right. we don't <laughs> get into those deep weeds. Um, and you also have a uh, wonderful new book about, out, which we are here to talk about. It's James Madison, America's First Politician. Um, so you wrote another book about some of the, actually you wrote two other books about this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Why zoom in on Madison? Why, you know, what is it about Madison that requires more? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, a lot of it had to do with just when I was doing the research for my last book, I wasn't entirely happy with where the scholarship on Madison was. I felt like there was um, a gap between people who did his political theory and people who write his larger biographies. The political theory people tend to focus on those period of like 1787, 1788, the Federalist period. Mm -hmm. um, and then the biographers cover the whole ground, but they don't dive in enough on the on the political theory side. And I was struck that Madison was not just a political philosopher. I mean, I'm not even sure you'd call him primarily a political philosopher, but he was a politician. He was a very thoughtful politician and he had unique theories and ideas of politics. So that was sort of the inspiration to sort of look at Madison through the lens of political philosophy, but look at it not just his Federalist writings, but his entire life. The whole Madison. The whole Madison, yeah. Um, so. I mean, one of the things that today's younger generation knows is that Alexander Hamilton was a much better rapper. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Um, but something our generation knows is that Madison was a better philosopher. Yes. Um, so why don't you just sort of broad brushstrokes just tell people who, who was James Madison? Yeah, he was, um, well, the, the, the subtitle of the book is America's First Politician, which is not... I don't mean that in a literal sense, but I mean it in a couple senses. Um, I mean, for starters, he was a professional politician extremely early, um, which is extraordinary for the time because most people like a Washington or a Jefferson own plantations, and so they always had to be kind of minding their estates. Madison doesn't take ownership of Montpelier until his father dies in 1801, so he can dedicate the first you know, 50 years or so, 40, 50 years or so of his life, his, dedicated to politics. And he develops through the course of his um, political career what I think is a unique political vision and one that I also think is um, really influences and informs our understanding of how politics should function today. And it's the idea of what you might call balance, where Madison's grand vision of politics was not where, you know, a Hamiltonian idea where the elites would sort of mine the shop for all the masses, or even a Jeffersonian idea where you know the people are virtuous and the expression of the popular majority's will should rule. Madison is very skeptical of the of the masses and the elites, and instead sees good politics as the source of justice and promoting the general welfare. And by that, the idea is that in an extended republic, which he talks about in Federalist 10, it's a large country, factions have to come together, they battle, they battle it out, nobody dominates, so eventually they have to compromise, and that's where you get something approaching justice in the general welfare. And I mean, that's the theory of Federalist 10, but it's also what's really interesting is that if you look through the course of Madison's political career, you see him operating under that theory of politics again and again and again. You see it in the set early 1780s when he's in Congress trying to forge a compromise on a tax plan for the Continental Congress. You see it when Jefferson wins the presidency and the Republicans or the Democratic Republicans as we call them, they don't go measure for measure against the Federalists. Even see it as late as 1829, at the end of his life when he's fighting against Calhoun's ideas of nullification, there's just this common thread of how politics is supposed to function and how well-functioning politics is actually the backbone of self-government. Yeah, I mean, so when I think of, uh, if not that I get asked this a lot, but when people ask me, like, who's my founding father, it, it's basically Madison. Yeah. I mean, everyone likes George Washington because mm -hmm. what's not to like, but... Right. But he wasn't a deep and profound thinker in the way that some of these, he didn't have a grand 
theory about no. political no. life. And um, although more and more these days, for reasons extraneous to this, I think George Washington's understanding of personal rectitude and good character is a very is is a much underappreciated thing in politics. Yes, I agree. <laughs> but we can do that another yeah. time. Um, but when I try to talk to like college students about this stuff, I always, you know, Madison believed that you couldn't, that there may be better ways to set up a small nation or a small city state where everybody worked together and everybody was on the same page. Maybe you could have plebiscitory democracy on everything, but you can't do, the, one of the things the founders, particularly the Madison understood, is you can't do it at scale, right? There's just no way. There's just no way. You could, and so the way you get buy-in from everybody is by having it be bottom up rather than top down where the decisions kind of work their way through the process from the ground, from far out, and the things that make it to the Capitol and make it to Washington are the ones that need to be addressed as national questions because they're too big to be dealt with regionally. And all That's that exactly of. right. Yeah, and that informs his, his Virginia plan, which he writes in advance of the Constitutional Convention. He's actually willing to give the Congress a veto over state legislation that interferes with the national uh, interest. And I, I, you sort of touched on something, the idea of buy-in, I think is an important um, thing to bear in mind. And it's why I think Madison is relevant today, which is, you know, back in 1787, this was, a country really on paper in many respects. I mean, we didn't have, there were all sorts of things we were lacking. You know, we didn't have a nationally integrated economy. We had regional economies. We didn't even have a national currency, so we couldn't even develop an economy. Um, we didn't have anything approaching the kind of national culture that we do today, which is something I think people take for granted, yeah. is how like um, parochial culture was back then. There was no good transportation. These are, so there were real legitimate questions. I mean, we look back in time and like, well, it was a fait accompli that America would remain united, but that was very much an open question. Right. Even after the war, I mean, after the war, you begin to see commercial rivalries between the states, which could have ended up in, you know, disunion. Um, and so what's interesting about both Madison and Hamilton is their political ideas are about facilitating union. Hamilton's very clear um, in his belief of the prosperity of commerce. Like, if I'm making money and you're making money and we're making money together, we're not gonna separate from each other because we're like, you know, the, this sort of, they both have David Hume's kind of, um, you know, view of human nature, right? So if my passions are like facilitated by yours and the, we're both making money, then, so that was Hamilton's idea, which was a brilliant idea in many respects. But Madison's I think um, is more durable, which is that if I am, I'm participating in the federal government the national government, and I believe that the policies that this government are producing are gonna be just and fair and ultimately in my interests, then I am gonna have a reason to unite almost on a kind of emotional or spiritual level that if, if the government has a reputation for dealing with different factions fairly, right. that is gonna strengthen the bonds of union. And I, re I think that that is one of our problems today in American society is that nobody really believes that the government is gonna consistently do justice to them. That, you know, Democrats and liberals believe that when Democrats and liberals are in charge, they'll have justice done to them. And Republicans believe when Republicans are in charge, they'll have justice done. But when the other party's in charge, every, the op opposition is always expecting to you know, be treated unfairly. And I think that is so contrary to Madison's vision of politics. And not, not just his vision of politics, but how he actually engaged in politics. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, I mentioned a moment ago, you know, when Jefferson wins the presidency in 1801, the Sedition Act expires, um, criminal, which criminalized dissent of the government. It's not renewed. Mm -hmm. um, they don't remove um, Federalist office holders. I mean, they remove some, but not all. Their policy program is moderate and you know, Jefferson in 1804 wins Massachusetts, which is extraordinary to think about how Federalist Massachusetts had been. And you know, Madison picks up the same sort of um, agenda when he's president as well. And the, by the time he leaves office, you know, the era of good feelings is credited to James Monroe. Mm -hmm. But it's an, remarkable that he had been in president for eight years, and when he leaves, the country is basically united, mm -hmm. which is, especially in 2021, it's an extraordinary thought. I mean, it's completely incomprehensible, you know. Isn't the era of good feelings a little bit like 
that old line about the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor empire. Um, yeah, there's some, I mean, it didn't, ultimately, I think the problem with the air of good feelings, well, there were a couple problems, neither of which really directly relate to Madison. The first is the economic panic in 1819, which just sets the South on a different trajectory. Which and and then the act, you know, having acquired Louisiana, then we got to deal with decide. Okay, well, what's going to be slave versus what's going to be free? But I do think that if you think about it in more narrow terms of sort of the policy debates and divisions that had existed during Madison's term get resolved in a way that is reasonably uh, satisfactory to the right. broad majority. And I think later politicians fail to. Madison to sort of be mindful of Madison's emphasis on pragmatism and moderation, mm -hmm. which I think are two qualities of his that don't get appreciated as fully as I think they should. Yeah, I mean, the example I often use about all this, about this idea of buy-in on the Madisonian scale is, is the amendment process to the Constitution. It's, it's not supposed to be hard just because they don't want the Constitution to change much. It's supposed to be hard in the sense that you have to get all these states to agree to it, or the state legislatures, you have to, is that you want the argument to sufficiently ripen throughout the country mm. that if, if in fact you do approve a constitutional amendment, there will be deep and wide buy-in for it. Right. Because otherwise, if you just keep changing the, what the constitution means, that is a recipe for sort of banana republic type yes, stuff, right? that's right. That's right. It's a problem with a lot of state constitutions as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the state constitutions end up being insanely long. Nobody knows what's in them. Nobody really knows how they function. Our constitution is remarkably different in that respect as well. And and nobody has reverence for the constitution of Pennsylvania, for instance. But and that's another thing Madison appreciated. I mean, he talks about the importance of reverence and sort of binding people to the regime is a very important thing. And, um, you know, it, it, so the amendment process also sort of illustrates another kind of Madisonian idea, which is the larger, the broader, the ma more durable the majority, the less likely it is to be a danger to the public interest. Mm -hmm. You know, a fleeting narrow majority of like 50.01% of the country that is a danger, you know, the worry there would be that 50.01 is just looking to grab something from the 49.99. Right. But as we get to you know, two thirds of the country and two thirds of the country after a long debate, the chances are that two thirds of the country actually is on to something about what's good for the country. And I think that's something that in today's politics people don't really appreciate. You know, we have in our head the notion that uh, majorities should rule, which they should. But the question is, why should they rule? Why should majorities rule? I mean, there's nothing inherently appropriate about 50% of the country governing, you know, 50 minus one. Um, majorities are supposed to rule because they are the best indicator of what the interest of the whole public is. But we know from historical experience that they're often wrong. And so what Madison was trying to do was figure out a way for through time, without knowing future policy debates, how do we empower good majorities while stifling bad majorities. Right. And that's sort of the idea behind the extended republic, the notions of sort of like rather than just half plus one, but developing consensus. These are all ways to sort of sustain a regime over time. Right, and Senate votes by state, House votes by population. These are ways to get different perspectives on the same, and get, get buy-in, get, yeah. you know, even things like, all right, let, let's, since we, we talked about the constitutional amendment process. Um, walk me through, why was Madison opposed to the Bill of Rights and then change his mind and how much did he actually change his mind mm, about it? Th those are good questions. Well, there's a couple issues with the Bill of Rights. First of all, he didn't think it would do much good um, in the sense that he called them parchment barriers. So his attitude was that if, a, if a, the people really want to violate the rights of a minority, which is what the Bill of, the Bill of Rights is basically protecting minorities, right. right? I mean, the First Amendment is not meant to protect popular speech because popular speech doesn't need protected. Right. It's meant to protect unpopular speech. And you know, the Fourth, the Fifth, the Sixth, the Seventh, and the Eighth Amendments are basically intended to protect people who are suspected or convicted of crimes. So this is gonna be a minority. And you know, if a majority really wants to just seize the rights of a minority, you know, the, a, a, 
a list of 10 rights is not going to stop them. So that's one reason. He didn't think it would do much good. The other concern that he had was that if we start enumerating our rights, pe the government might get the wrong idea that these are all the rights we have. Right. So that's why you get um, the Ninth Amendment, right? Just basically, hey, FYI, we have more rights than what are listed here. So there were philosophical reasons, but there's also, and this is what's sort of really interesting about the ratification uh, debate, is that Madison kind of smelled a rat, to borrow the phrase that Patrick Henry used. So by the time we get to um, Massachusetts's ratifying convention, which is in early 1788, the uh, opponents to the Constitution are increasingly changing their tactics. Rather than try and defeat it outright, they're trying to attach conditions to ratification. So the idea would be, well, we'll agree to ratify the Constitution if you amend it in this way. Okay, that's something that Madison is opposed to. Madison recognizes this is a basically a way to kill the Constitution without having to be the trigger man. So mm -hmm. this is sort of like Patrick Henry's idea. Um, and so that's why he's opposed to amendments like that. So that's one reason. Another reason is, is that when there's this sort of basket of amendments that are, opposed, are proposed, some of them are consistent with um, you know, the English tradition of civil liberties. So you get some, like, you know, the Second Amendment, for instance, which goes back to the, the, the English Bill of Rights. Um, and then you get a bunch of them that are reminiscent of George Mason's Virginia Declaration of Rights. But there's other amendments that are trying to limit the power of Congress, which Madison doesn't want to do. So ultimately, that's why he's opposed at the, during ratification, he's opposed to amendments. But then once the ratification has been sort of done, mm -hmm. he changes his mind because, well, what harm can it do is sort of the thing. And, you know, he's running for Congress against James Monroe. So it's a, it's a clever political maneuver he does where he just, that was the major argument that the anti-federalists ran on for the elections for the first Congress. So Madison co-ops it. And there's this funny letter I mentioned in the book about how that summer George Mason wrote this angry letter to his son. Like, it's ridiculous that Madison of all people would be the champion of of, uh, of the Bill of Rights. But you know, Madison, like I said, he was a politician. So a, a lot of it was a political move. It was a brilliant political move at that. I mean, as you say, the Bill of Rights, this is a, in contemporary politics, this is something, you know, I often bring up with people. There's a, there's a fad or fetidization of majoritarianism these, mm -hmm. majoritarianism these days in some parts of, particularly in sort of progressive circles, the Senate, it's evil because it's not proportional, all that kind of stuff. And I get the arguments, but on a fundamental level, there are lots of anti-majoritarian things that are protective of liberalism. And, you know, the Supreme Court is the least democratic branch of the government. And the Bill of Rights are basically anti-majoritarian things that say it doesn't matter how many votes you get. You can't you take away my speech. Disease, you can't take right. away my right to associate. And it seems to me that this is a tension that is that, that we go through waves in American history where people seem to forget that the whole point of the con or big chunks of the constitution are about how to protect individual liberties which everybody claims to support when they're the individual liberties that they like in the context that they like right um so i recently did this panel at here at ai on a new book about edmund burke's political economy mm -hmm. and one of the questions I, I i had a very light hand as moderator but one of the questions i asked is you know, about the East India Company, Edmund Burke and Adam Smith had similar but different positions on it. I believe Adam Smith wanted to um, eliminate the East India Company's uh, charter entirely because of the abuses, and Burke wanted to introduce competition to mm -hmm. to screw with it essentially <laughs> and like get, and make it more honest. And it's what explains the differences between them. And the the, the answer, which I, I I'm a little embarrassed it didn't occur to me, was that. Adam Smith was a professor of political theory or economic theory, right. and and Burke was a sitting politician, right. right? And so politicians are going to come up with slightly different answers than theorists will, and I think that's cor a correct answer. What is an example with Madison of a place where you think either he gave in to the political theorist side of him against his political interests, or gave in to the politician side? against his political theory? That is a good question. Um, so Madison's, well, let's talk about Madison's uh, economic views, because I think that's really where you see a lot of this. Madison has some well-sourced but wrong 
profoundly wrong, as it turns out, ideas about economics. And they, and I think it relates to the fact that he was not an original economic thinker. He was an original thinker about politics. And his views about politics end up informing his views about economics. So he's got this sort of stretching all the way back to classical antiquity in the Roman Republic. And the strength of the Roman Republic was built on the small freeholder, right? The sort of small landowner who would supply, you know, he was independent so he could be a citizen of Rome. He could exercise independent judgment. And he was uh, there and ready and able to defend the state against threats so we don't have to have a standing army. And that gets ported forward into the sort of the Commonwealth theories of uh, James Harrington and the country Whigs and Madison, unsurprisingly, as a planter from Virginia, embraces this idea. And Madison's belief is that because the Americans are uh, farmers, they can feed themselves and they purchase manufactured goods from Great Britain that they can do without. Great, Great Britain cannot do without our grain, but we can do without their teacups. Mm -hmm. So Madison's theory was that we are economically stronger than Great Britain. Mm -hmm. And this was wrong, this was terribly wrong. And Madison at various, and it's remarkable, at various points in time throughout his political career, he tries to introduce this into public policy. 1789, he's suggesting we start basically raising tariffs on Great Britain, like he's promoting commercial warfare. The first Congress, like in May of 1789, they're writing the first, literally the first tax law, and Madison's suggesting, hey, Great Britain doesn't have a commercial treaty with them. Let's raise the rates on their shipping. And that gets voted down in the, in the Senate, which is more federalist and more partial to New England. He tries it again after the French and the British go to war during the French Revolution, after Louis XVI is executed. He's just commercial warfare, let's do it again. Um, Hamilton comes in very quickly, sort of pulls the rug out from underneath Madison by getting John Jay to go in the Jay Treaty. Madison, and the Jay Treaty basically makes the promise we won't do that. Madison doesn't like that. And then in 1807, after the assault on the Chesapeake, the, the Embargo Act was initially meant to be a temporary measure because the feeling was is that, well, we're about to go to war with Great Britain. We need to get our boats off the high seas. Um, we don't want any of our merchant men out there. If we go to war, um, Madison says, let's just turn this into the great experiment commercial discrimination that I always wanted to have. And the whole thing is a disaster. And it's, you know, it, because Madison was wrong. Great Britain's economy was much more advanced than America's. Great Britain was able to acquire food from other sources because they're, they were Great Britain. And the American economy is absolutely decimated by this. And you get, you know, piracy and smuggling and also Jefferson has to be very heavy handed. And so ultimately, at the end of his political career, Madison, for all intents and purposes, abandons this idea. Um, having learned through hard experience that commercial discrimination isn't going to work and that Hamilton was right in the sense that, no, we have to build up our own economic foundation. So this is why at the end of his presidency, he charters a bank of the United States. He does protective tariffs. He basically admits that we have to become more like Great Britain if we're going to stand up to Great Britain in the future. So it's a remarkable kind of transition late in his career. And what's interesting about it, though, is that even though he changes his mind, at least in effect, he never admits. He, it's sort of one of his interesting, I don't want to call it character defects, but he was rarely willing to admit that he was wrong. So even in retirement, he's writing letters saying, oh, you know, the Embargo Act could have worked if it wasn't for the greed of those New Englanders. But he still <laughs> effectively changes his mind. Yeah. It's sort of funny. There's a lot of that in Churchill. I mean, there are a lot of, a lot of politicians who are zigzagging all over the place, but they refuse to see themselves as anything right. other than consistent. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, like... It, it seems to me fair to say that a widespread view is that, that Madison was a mediocre president. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying he was a mediocre president. I'm saying that is a widely held view is, that yes. he was a mediocre president. How fair is that? Um, I think it's fair in some respects. There are mediocre things that he does. I would say he has a very Whiggish view of the presidency. 
um, similar to you know how the Whigs viewed the presidency later on, but also harkening back to the British Whigs and sort of very much a constitutionally constrained monarchy. We want to box the executive branch in, and the legislative branch should be su supreme. So you see that during his presidency in the sense that he is trying to conduct diplomatic relations with Great Britain and France to keep the country out of war, settle the disputes with both of them, but Congress refuses to give him tools sufficient to this task. So, for instance, the Embargo Act is repealed right before he becomes president and it's replaced with the Non-Intercourse Act, which basically says, uh, if you promise, pinky swear, not to go to Great Britain and France, you can, tr you can, you can go off and ship goods, which n it was completely unenforceable. So it was a paper tiger, and that's what Congress gave him with that. Later on with Macon's Bill Number 2 was a ridiculous piece of legislation. He, Congress never gave him the leverage that he would have needed to conduct negotiations, but he never asked, and he did not assert himself on Congress. Even in probably the most ridiculous thing he did was he did not nominate Albert Gallatin to be Secretary of State because uh, the, there was a faction of Republicans in the Senate who hated Gallatin for a variety of reasons, but Gallatin was clearly the best man for the job, but he didn't do it. He refused to fight them. And it's this weird absurdity in his presidency where he ends up effectively being his own Secretary of State mm -hmm. because the guy that he hires, Robert Smith, is incapable of doing the job. And so Madison, you know, I mean, those, like the dispatches that have Smith's signature on it are, they have, but Madison wrote them, mm -hmm. which is really crazy when you think about it. Like, why didn't he stand up to these guys? So I would say that would be his main failure as president. But again, this is, you know, it's a unique view of the presidency that Madison held. And Jefferson held it as well, but Jefferson was a hypocrite frankly, and was happy to sort of, you know, host dinners late at night with members of Congress and basically whisper in their ear while like sort of pretending like he was independent of the legislative branch. Madison was independent of the legislative branch. And, and it so he's in a moment in time before Andrew Jackson where you know, Jackson's just going to assert himself. Madison doesn't see that as the role of the president. So, and insofar as he should have asserted himself, that's, you have to sort of knock him on that. But I think there are real reasons to admire him. Um, and I would contrast him to somebody that you and I absolutely can't stand, Woodrow Wilson. Mm -hmm. Madison compares very favorably to Woodrow Wilson in the sense that both of them are conducting wars that are not uniformly popular throughout the country, mm -hmm. right? World War I, not uniformly popular. The War of 1812, it passes narrowly in the Senate. The War Declaration, I think it's like 19 to 12 in the Senate because New England is uniformly opposed. And whereas Wilson, enacts the Sedition Act of 1917 to try to suppress dissent. Madison never does that, which I think is something, that restraint, I think, speaks remarkably well of him. You can imagine what Woodrow Wilson would have done had he heard that the Hartford Convention was meeting. Like, let's say the Germans in, like, Kansas were having their version of the Hart. What would, well, Wilson would have sent, you know, the army in against yeah. them. Yeah. Madison we just waited to see what they did. He didn't make any moves against them. So I think that's something really remarkable about Madison. And then the other thing that I would say about his presidency is the final act, the last two years, are extraordinarily productive moments in Congress. And Madison offers them an agenda of uh, internal improvements, uh, a rechartered bank, and then protective tariffs. And that ends up becoming basically the political economy of the Republican Party, like the Lincolnian Republicans. Mm -hmm. And it's really the blueprint for American economic development all the way up until the Great Depression, which is really remarkable. And it was Madison who sort of, it, they were Hamiltonian ideas on an economic level, mm -hmm. but Madison and his allies like Henry Clay are the ones who figure out the politics of how, you know, because Hamilton had these ideas but it created enormous disunity in the 1790s. Madison and Clay and Gallatin rework the ideas in such a way that you get political harmony, at least until you know the disputed election of 1824, which is really remarkable. And I think that's a real credit to his political acumen. So obviously, and you know this several orders of magnitude better than I do, there were significant differences among the founding fathers, mm -hmm. right? Philosophical differences, cultural differences uh, between Madison and 
George Washington height differences. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, um, uh, but one of the things that basically united all of them, you can correct me, maybe there were some second order founders who didn't see it this way. Um, but united all of them in their political theory was this sort of Montesquieuian idea, Madisonian idea, that the different branches of government would be jealous guardians of their prerogatives. Right. Right. That, that the, the whole Federalist, you know, checking ambition with ambition thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, Hamilton and, and Adams had certain views about how you use the power of aristocracy and harness it and blah, blah, blah. And Jefferson had a different view about, you know, you know human nature. But this is a point that Irving Kristol made years ago, uh, praise be upon him. You know, the, the American Revolution was a successful revolution because it took into account human nature and created institutions and political theories that took into account human nature. Yes. So coming forward to today, how horrified would James Madison be of the way in which the Congress, the first branch of government, has in so many ways abdicated its responsibilities to do its basic functions, to do its mm. job of, of actually writing legislation, not just sort of saying the secretary shall and, and do these enabling act kind of moves. Mm -hmm. um, is this an indictment of the founders in general that we get that, that, that over time their conception of how these institutions would work based upon their understanding of human nature seems to have hit a shelf life in a certain way? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. I've thought about that a lot. Um, I think that it, there's an interesting, I want to say it's in Federalist 50, I want to say, um, where Madison in 49 and 50, he's dealing with, okay, well, how are these branches going to check each other? And he's dealing with a, one of Jefferson's batty ideas of having regular re recourse to conventions to resolve disputes. And Madison is arguing in that, um, well, that's not going to work. Congress will dominate those because people know their congressmen and they're not going to know the president. Mm -hmm. And so therefore Congress is going to, th there's no way to check Congress through a constitutional, like a convention, a Jeffersonian style convention to fix errors. If Congress is the cause of the errors, which Madison's believes it will be. And I, I think that the problem nowadays is, is mass media. I would say, to be perfectly honest, because when you think about how do these branches speak to the country as a branch, Congress speaks through the law, right? Now, individual members of Congress can talk to the country, but they're not speaking for the Congress as a whole. The Congress as a whole speaks through the through the laws, which in a modern society like this are incredibly complicated. The Supreme Court has it a little easier. They, five members of the court can write an opinion, and oftentimes the opinions can be very well uh, written. How does the president speak to the country? All he has to do is talk. Mm -hmm. All he has to do is talk now. Whereas 150 years ago, before mass media, the, the president didn't have nearly the kind of power that he has. And I think we've added, um, you know, it's really ironic, I think, when you look at the White House, when you strip away from it, the layers of you know historical bombast it is really a simple house you know if most neighborhoods in like the wealthier neighborhoods in america are going to have square footage that's greater than the white house mm -hmm. the white house was designed to reflect the humble nature of the president as the first citizen even the choice to call him the president the, nowadays we go well that's a you know if you're you're the president that's a pretty you know in the senate they say mr president or madam president it literally all it meant was the presiding officer over a meeting right um, but we have through a variety of reasons the presidency has expanded and that expansion i think is cultural I think it's psychological, and I think that Congress kneeling before the presidency is really a downstream of the fact that that's what their voters want them to do. Congress remains at its core a creature of its voters, um, and they're not standing up for its, Congress not standing up for itself against the president is a sign that the voters look to the president first and to Congress second, and Congress is behaving in that ma manner. Now, whether or not that means the Madisonian vision of l the legislature being centrally powerful is obsolete, I don't know. Um, 
But I, I would say that what we really need in this country is for the people, not so much for Congress to stand up for itself. Congress is not going to do that in the sense if, if its voters at home don't want them to. And I think what we need in this country is to realize that in a place as di in crazy diversity in this country, the only place where we're going to solve our problems is where we all come together and deliberate and negotiate. And there's only one place that's going to happen. And that's going to happen in Congress. It's not going to happen in the White House. The president cannot possibly reflect the diversity of the country. It's not going to happen in the courts. For, I mean, for starters, the judges are all lawyers nowadays. So you have a very narrow slice of, of, of society. It's only in Congress. And, I, and so I would say that, you know, the, the fault, I, I don't want to blame the American people because that's pat and easy. But I, I, I think that we need to get back to this idea of Congress being the first branch. And that is something that we've lost over. I, I mean, I really think we began to lose that with Wilson and even before that, like with Teddy Roosevelt, mm -hmm. sort of like Teddy Roosevelt was the first like character in the White House. And then Wilson, well, we could, that was proof of concept for my idea of a you know presidential governance. And we've been... And what's so remarkable to me about it is how manifestly ineffective presidential government governance is. Right. The president cannot, simply cannot do the things that Wilson thought that the president can do. And I, what I would really like to see is the country abandon that idea and stop looking to the president. You know, stop looking to the president as the guy or girl who's going to solve our problems, which is just, we're a country of 330 million people. It's just insane when you think about it, like when you say it out loud like that. The one person, I mean, goodness gracious. Yeah, I mean, I am, I have flights of jealousy over Switzerland because every now and then they do a poll in Switzerland and a sizable chunk of the people can't name their president. Yeah. And that's a better... That's nice. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. You know? But, um, and... I mean, I would say, Jonah, for most of our adult lifehood, lifetime, the president of the United States has been living rent-free in the heads of the opposition. Right. Like, he drives... Half the country is being driven to distraction because of the person who's in the White House. It, it, this is no way to govern a country. It's no way for half of the country to be driven insane because they can't stand every morning they turn on the TV and they see the face of the guy that they voted against who doesn't reflect their interests or values at all. That is no way to govern a country like this. All right. Well, some of this conversation we're going to have to continue on my podcast. But um, uh, I do want to just for the record say that I, I'm okay with blaming the American people a little bit. <laughs> and... Um, and the fact that the American people want their president to basically be their elected monarch is a problem. Yes. And I, because I have this working theory that Americans think and are encouraged to think by politicians that we live in, a, in effectively in a parliamentary democracy. Right. So you have, if you, if you paid even half close attention to the Democratic primaries in 2020, Candidate after candidate would get up and say, on day one, I will right. get the guns, right. stop the oil, do this, do that. That no president has the authority or power to do. do that. And the problem is, is when you tell people you're going to do that on day one or in your first hundred days or whatever, and that, and that it's going to be easy to do, and then you don't do it because we're not set up for the president to be able to do that, <laughs> you create a very sort of dangerous, like uh, almost... It's almost perfect fodder for conspiracy theories. Because yeah. if if they told me this was easy and then we couldn't do it, so therefore horrible what FDR would call malefactors of great wealth or right. Bernie Sanders, right. millions and billions, they must be thwarting right. us, right? Yes. And that breeds even further cynicism and distrust. When in reality, it's that you know it's like uh, John Bolton always used to say, you know, should we use diplomacy or force? And he would say. Well, it depends. You know, which is a better tool, a fork or a spoon? It depends what you're it doing, depends right? Depends on what you're doing. The people expect something from the from our constitutional system. Our constitutional system wasn't designed to give them in the way they're asking for right. it. And then you get states of, uh, you know, then you get people, presidents living rent free in, in yeah. the other parties' you heads. Do. You know. Yeah. So more broadly speaking, since we're up to present day and all this kind of stuff. What would you want a member of Congress who reads your book? Um, um, and sad to say, the number of members of Congress these days who would read a book like this is shrinking. I don't say there are congressmen who would, but you know, I, there are lots who wouldn't um, because they're too busy doing TikTok videos. But um, you know, what would you want someone interested in politics 
or interest in running for office who really does have the best interests of the country at heart, what would you want them to take away from Madison's example or take away from the book? I would say that the lesson from Madison more than anything else is that effective governance requires the building of consensus more than anything else. So, you know, like in Congress right now, I would say far and away the most impressive members that we have are actually Joe Manchin, Kirsten Sinema, and Susan Collins mm -hmm. because they're, they're moderates which is, you know, so I'm to the right of all of them. But what put aside their ideological position and think about what they're trying to do. They're trying to craft a broad coalition in favor of accomplishing some public purpose. That is the way if you want to if you're in Congress and you actually want to do stuff other than name post offices, that's the only way to do it. You have to think beyond your uh relatively narrow ideological clique and dispense with the notion that you are going to find yourself in a position akin to Lyndon Johnson in 1965 or Franklin Roosevelt in 1933. Black Swan events like that are so rare and so random, I mean, hence the, hence the name, that you should, you can't build a political model off of them. Right. Both sides seem I would I would say this too as a juxtaposition. I, I that one of the least Madisonian moments in American presidential history was when the night before Teddy Roosevelt in the 1912 um, presidential the Republican convention you know gives a speech to his uh, supporters and say we stand at Armageddon and we do battle for the Lord. That is the wrong way to think about politics. Right. right? It, there is no getting rid of the left in the United States of America. There is no getting rid of the right in the United States of America. Elections are not like the Super Bowl. Like, you know, the, you know, the, the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are the champions this year. That's not how politics works. There's elections around every corner and both sides always come back. And you know, what's really interesting as well is how they are really good at sort of whittling away at the legislative accomplishments that the other side did when they had their narrow majority. Like, you know, when the Democrats in 2010 passed the Affordable Care Act, the Republicans get in in 2017, they can't repeal it outright, but man, they sure did. They sure did carve the guts out of that. Mm -hmm. thing out. You know, and the Democrats are gonna do the same thing with tax reform too, in all likelihood. This is what they do. Right. This is in the absence of consensus, your policy accomplishments are going to be fleeting and they're going to be shallow. And the idea is not to try and get everything you want, but the idea is to try and get some important things that you want and find some things that are important to the other side that you can live with. That's how politics is supposed to work. And that is something that I think too few members of Congress appreciate. And like you said, there's too many of them now that are there just because of the celebrity that they can acquire as a, as a consequence, um, be it through social media or talking to ideological diehards on, on you know, the cable news networks, on both, on all the cable sure. news networks. You know, they speak to that narrow slice and they build their fundraising base and, I would I would say to them to what ultimate purpose are you doing this? Like what is all of this money going to get you to get reelected so you can what? Do nothing? Because that's what's going to come of this. You're not going to get anything done. I mean, that I think is the great difference between a Madisonian vision Madison actually got things done during his lifetime. You know, he was pragmatic and he, it wasn't just pragmatism from um, a proper sense of his own self-interest, but it was a pragmatism built on the idea that in a country like this, the only way we're going to get anything done is if we, we find common ground. That's it. Other than that, it's, we're, we're, we're just battling between the four yard lines. That's what we're doing. Okay, so you write, to fix our republic, he would want us to work harder, think unconventionally, and act a bit Machiavellian, just as he did. What do you mean to be Machiavellian, and, and other than just be destructive in politics? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's unfortunate because the word Machiavellian it refers to like you know you're not supposed to be Machiavellian, um, but you know Chris Machiavelli was this great practitioner of politics who understood politics as an art and a craft, and that sometimes you have to be artificial. Right, um, and so, he definitely took human nature into account. Yes, he did. <laughs> he absolutely did, and Madison did that too. Um, and you know, it, 
it's sort of a fun thing, especially for, you know, college students who might be, you know, uh, watching this while they're also taking class in political theory. You know, you'll read, you know, in your political theory 101, you'll read some David Hume, you'll read some John Locke, and then they'll throw in Federal, Federalist 10. When he published Federalist 10, he did not actually believe what he was writing, hmm. which is an interesting sort of thing to appreciate about the Federalist Papers, is that some of them were not entirely honest. Some of them were, in fact, somewhat dishonest. Federalist 10 is, of course, Madison's great um, justification for the extended republic. And the idea we talked about earlier, you know, the idea of a large republic with a diversity of interests is going to, the factions will have to negotiate and compromise, and so it will be a benevolent majority. All right, that's the basic idea. That defense, that idea in Federalist 10, what he's actually talking about there was his Virginia plan of government, which the convention eviscerated. Mm -hmm. um, because if you follow the logic through on Federalist 10, at least if you're Madison, if national majorities are benevolent, then they should be able to do pretty much anything they want, which is what he proposes in the Virginia plan. He proposes that they should have the power to exercise legislation in all cases where the harmony of the union is at stake or the states are deemed to be incompetent, which is not what the Constitution does. It enumerates power. But importantly, Madison also called for a veto over the state governments. In sort of the way the king of Great Britain was able to veto colonial legislation. In the Virginia plan, there's no override for congressional vetoes over the state. So Madison wants to sort of set Congress up almost the way the, so the king had been set up over the colonies. And this gets voted down. And Madison, around the same time that he is writing, preparing Federalist 10 in October of 1787, he writes this long letter to Jefferson basically condemning the Constitution. And this isn't going to work. They gutted my best ideas. The states are going to dominate over the federal government. The whole thing is going to fall apart. Um, so Federalist 10 is actually not written in defense of the Constitution per se, or the ideas themselves were formulated for. Now, the, but it's what's interesting about this, though, um, is that Madison's doubts about the Constitution are actually what make him such an effective polemicist on its behalf, which sounds contradictory, but there's Madison and the Anti-Federalists agree on a, a, a similar, they have a similar critique of the Constitution, that, um, that this idea of your federalism itself the state governments have their sphere, the federal government has its sphere. The anti-federalists and Madison both believe that's a contradiction in terms. An imperio in imperium cannot be sustained. All right. Madison thinks that the states are going to end up overwhelming the federal government. The anti-federalists believe that the federal government is going to end up overwhelming the states. So Madison actually thinks the anti-federalists are exactly wrong. Mm -hmm. So when you read his Federalist essays, particularly in the 30s and 40s, where he's defending um, you know, the grants of power that, that Congress is given, he's really effective in striking down the sort of errors of the anti-federalists. Like, they're just being paranoid. This is not going to destroy the state governments. If anything, the state government, he inserts this idea, if anybody's going to dominate, it's actually going to be the state governments. This is very ironic, mm -hmm. is that he didn't really like the Constitution. I mean, he comes to love like the Constitution. And by the end of his life, he, he, he looks back at the Constitution as this amazing, you know, sort of that divine hand of providence, right? Um, which is sort of the Enlightenment way of saying the will of God, because they couldn't say God, they'd use providence with capital P. Um, the divine hand of providence. But in... In 1787, he's mad about the uh, about his political defeats, but he's sort of like, "I'll be damned if the anti-federalists are going to lie about this thing." <laughs> sort of, so it makes for a very interesting read when you understand the context of it. So. I was listening to the American Revolution uh, season of the Revolutions podcast, mm -hmm. and Mike Duncan makes the case that the Federalist Papers really had almost no effect on ratification, that they were written late, that they weren't all that influential, um, and that, that they're sort of been read into the story as being mm -hmm. much more important than mm -hmm. they really were. Is that, I mean, I like Duncan, but he could be wrong about this. Historians disagree about lots of things. Um, I would say that, I mean, their immediate effect was virtually null. I mean, uh -huh. the intention was to influence the election of the ratifying convention in New York to, to 
swing New York to the Federalist side. That doesn't have any effect. I do think, though, that um, the Federalist Papers, they are written late, but they are circulated among Federalist type of men. Mm -hmm. And so, and there's a bound edition of them, I think, early in 1788 before. And so the way that I think the advantage of thinking about or the importance of the Federalist Papers is that they uh, get uh, ideas that are out out there into the system, mm -hmm. and so, and and I think the way to think about this as well. So Madison gets this interesting essay letter from his dad. He's up in New York after the Constitution's ratified. He gets this letter from his dad. His dad tells him there was a you know planter who who was disposed to the Constitution, and uh, he went to Richmond. He heard some anti-federalist arguments, and he came back, and um, he became an anti-federalist, and he started spreading. So I think the virtue of the Federalist Papers is not so much in and of themselves as like essays. People read them, and they were like, oh, oh, but like maybe somebody read them, and then they're having like a church or something, or maybe at a tavern or something. They're having a conversation and somebody makes some ridiculous claim about how Congress can destroy the taxing power and then somebody in the room has read the Federalist Papers and we're like, no, that's actually not true. And because um, by the time of the Virginia Ratifying Convention in June of 1788, Madison's head count when he's going into that is we're going to win by five votes. And he's pretty close to correct. They win by 10, which suggests that nobody's mind was changed. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was researching the Virginia Ratifying Convention for this book, I was really excited. I was like, oh, this is going to be amazing. James Madison versus George Mason and Patrick Henry. Oh, they're awful. <laughs> and Madison himself, he's writing these letters like, oh, I hate this. I want to go home. And you really get the vibe at that, that everything that could have been said about the Constitution at that point had was. been said. Yeah. Um, something similar happened in Maryland. Like the Maryland Convention meets, they're like, well, we probably... I want to, let's go to the bar. Like, yeah. well, who's in favor of ratification? <laughs> All right, let's get out of here. Look, everybody been, and so I think in that sense, I think you have to credit the Federalist Papers uh -huh. in that, in sort of like getting the ideas out there and proliferating them. And that would be something that 200 and some odd years later would be impossible for us to quantify. Maybe I'm being a little optimistic there, but I did get the distinct impression when I was researching this that that was sort of their, like, we need to get the arguments into the bloodstream. And mm -hmm. I do think they helped in that respect. Were they read like, you know, like, you know, like, you know, like the book of Thessalonians, <laughs> you know, like reading from the pulpit? No, they weren't. It wasn't like that. But I think they still were influential in that respect. We have a really good sense who George Washington was. Mm -hmm. Indispensable man, mm -hmm. greatest horseman, all that kind of stuff. Got a pretty good sense of Jefferson, pros and cons, Sally Hemings, you know, hypocrisy, great writer. He was a ginger, so he can't trust him. But <laughs> um, who was Madison? I mean, like, just as a, as a guy, I know he was a short dude. He was. Um, was he happily married? Did he have kids that he loved? Did he, you know, was he a drinker? Just like, wh who was he as a guy outside when he went home? Okay, so he was, there's this interesting... Um, letter about Madison that was written uh, by the wife of Theodoric Bland. I can't remember her name, but Madison, she said, was a stiff and gloomy creature at the parties because, you know, when the French, when we get, and this is the 1780s, the French uh, signed the Franco-American Treaty as a party time in Philadelphia because the French come in and they're like, you know, they come in with their wine and a good time and, um, you know, Madison goes to a couple of these and he's, I mean, he, he, it's not just that he's short, it's that he looks like a boy. I mean, mm -hmm. he's short, he weighs a hundred pounds. He's five foot four and he weighs a hundred pounds. He looks like a boy and he, and he was very shy and halting in um, public kind of uh, events. In the Hamilton musical, they make him sickly. Is that, was that based on anything? He was, that... was so yes, when he had bouts of, um, what I think he said was like epilepsy. Uh -huh. um, he wasn't sickly like on a regular basis, but yes, he was. He, I don't. You know, Lynn Cheney argues that he uh, that he he did have a disease. I think she argues it pretty persuasively, um, but I also think he was a bit of a hypochondriac, probably because he was so small. I mean, mm. this is a this is not a an easy era to be alive, you know? I mean, right. people just like, oh, well, you know, I mean, Calvin Coolidge's son stubbed his toe on a tennis court, 
died from a blood blister, right? It's, it's tough times um, before the invention of penicillin, you know. Um, so I think maybe there was some hypochondria there, but he was extremely funny in private, in individual conversations. And he had um, a, a bit of, um, of a ribald sense of humor, mm -hmm. um, so and, and and he he's a he's a romantic as well. So he's not really marrying for like social status. He falls in love with this girl named Kitty Floyd when he's a congressman. She jilts him, and um, and uh, uh, he he doesn't really, as far as I could tell, he doesn't really pursue anybody until Dolly Madison. Mm -hmm. Dolly Madison is ends is Her husband dies in the uh, Philadelphia fever epidemic in 1794, I think. And so she ends up becoming like the most eligible bachelorette on the market. And by that point, Madison is sort of the big man in Congress. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how he's able to sort of, and, and, and Dolly writes, Dolly's letters, I mean, we don't have a lot of their correspondence because Madison was very careful. He left certain things behind, but other things were not for us to know, right? Mm -hmm. So there's only so much we can say about this, but, Dolly seems when she got married was thinking about her son Payne, um, like this Madison will take care of him. But he, they end up really having a real, a, a real lo love marriage. Doesn't have any children with her. Um, but she, she was a remarkable woman. She was funny. She was warm. She was beautiful. She. How tall was she? She was, I think, <laughs> five seven. She was yeah. taller than him, and she was uh, the life of the party. She. The, she is commemorated. She was, when she died, Zachary Taylor is the one who eulogized her as America's first lady. And, uh, you know, the th that's something to bear in mind about, you know, Washington society. Like nowadays, Washington, you know, go out to a nice restaurant, go to, the, you know, wherever, right, the Kennedy Center. There was nothing here. Yeah. There was nothing here. Um, and, and, and Jefferson, you know, Jefferson was a widow. He hated hosting parties, so there was nothing to do with Jefferson. But when Madison becomes president, Dolly hosts parties. And the, and, and the parties are fun, actually. Adams in Washington had had like formal soirees where everybody would stand and the president would come by and hello, how are you, Mr. President? It's good to see you. And like everybody said, and, but at like Dolly's parties, there was like ice cream and there was drinking and there was piano playing and there were card games and there was smoking. As a matter of fact, I think when James Madison ran for president in 1780 or 1808, Dolly had to like sort of say, oh, card games are bad. We don't, they play card <laughs> games. So like that's sort of a fun like kind of thing about Madison is that she like really loosened him up yeah, yeah, yeah. and got him to be kind of, you know, he had a reputation as um, as a great dancer. Probably my favorite, sort of the most quintessential sort of a grown adult Madison story. I don't remember when when the date of this was, but it was in the 1800s. So there, he's, he has some friends over and they're drinking and Madison suggests, well, let's try an experiment. Let's see how much we can drink before we get hung over. It's very Madisonian <laughs> sort of, you know, sort of. And and the 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 person who wrote the story, I think he was like the, a publisher or the wife of a publisher, maybe it was a lady on her own. The only thing that happened was everybody had a good time. But he was, though, I should be careful to say like, he was very moderate in his habits. Mm -hmm. So he very rarely drank to excess. And I think his, um, his enslaved servant, Paul Jennings said, you know, cause people would come through Mont, by Montpelier and the Madisons would host them and they bring out their wine and this was sort of the thing people would do is they'd all make toasts and they do toasts all night. People get drunk on all these toasts and his um, his servant said that Madison usually just raised the glass to his lips or, sp or like took a sip and then spit it back. So he was very, very temperate and careful in his habits. And the other thing I think is worth bearing in mind about him, I am not sure I've ever encountered any historical person other than Alexander Hamilton, who worked as hard as he does. And I am a hard working person. I really, if I'm not working on something, I start feeling very um, like bad about myself. I am shocked at the amount of work this guy was able to do. He, and I think that's why he was able to dominate American politics. He worked harder, he knew more than everybody else, and he was never vain enough that he couldn't reach a deal when a deal needed to be reached. So it's not particularly showy, but wow, he was really, he was a, I mean, it's really remarkable when you think about it between eight, 1787 
1817, he was in the midst of every major political battle and he won almost all of them. Which is, The only one who ever was able to outfox him was Hamilton, mm -hmm. which speaks of Hamilton's genius as well. But Hamilton's genius has been celebrated enough the last couple of years that it's time to give Madison his due, I think so. Yeah. Well, I, I await your musical. Yes. <laughs> uh, Jake Haas, the book is James Madison, America's First Politician. Thanks so much for doing this. Thanks for having me, Joan, it was great. Okay, everyone, that's the end of our discussion with Jay Cost. Thanks for watching. As always, though, let us know what other topics you'd like AEI scholars to cover on Viewpoint. And to learn more about Jay's book, check the links in the description.